Good evening. My name is Greg Gorga. I'm the executive director here at the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. I want to welcome you all here tonight for Wives and Daughters, Keepers of the Light. Yes. I want to introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, Willard Thompson is a researcher and writer of California history, living in Montecito with his wife, Jo. Willard has written both historical fiction and nonfiction, and two of his novels in his Chronicle of California trilogy are in print, and the third should be finished soon. He took a year off of writing in order to research and write Keepers of the Light, the history of the Point Conception Lighthouse Lens, uh, which we have in our store, and of course, was in time uh, with our exhibit opening. His, uh, and I. Uh, I know uh, his books and, uh, are going to be available for sale after the lecture, and I know he'd be happy to sign those for you uh, after his talk. He has also written and published a number of short biographies of Western heroes and a noticius for the Santa Barbara Historical Museum on Montecito adobes and the settlers who built them. He has contributed his research to our Point Conception Lens exhibit and our new Wives and Daughter exhibit, uh, which he will be talking about tonight. So I'm very happy to introduce our past board president, Mr. Willard Thompson. It is so good to have you all here and to see so many friendly faces out in the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. But we're here this evening to celebrate the opening of another wonderful Maritime Museum exhibit. Once again, our curator, Emily Falk, has guided her team to produce an outstanding contemporary museum exhibit. And we should all say thank you very much to Emily. And we're also here to talk about the wives and daughters who took on the responsibility of keeping important California lighthouses lighted and the mariners who sailed by them safe. So we'll be talking about the two women that you see on the screen. The one on the left probably needs no introduction. The one, uh, she was the niece of a king. And the one on the right, uh, by, the by the time our talk ends, I think you will know equally well. Her name is Julia Frances Curry Williams. These two women, in many ways, um, symbolize the Victorian era in which um, many of the lighthouse women function. And we're going to be talking about that a lot tonight. We'll also talk about several other prominent women lighthouse keepers um, who kept the lights along the California coast. So let's get started. OK, when William IV, king of the United Kingdom and the British dominions, died in 1837, he was succeeded on the throne by his niece, Alexandrina Victoria. Crowned queen on June 26, 1838, she reigned throughout the final 62 years of the 19th century and until her death in 1901. It was a tumultuous time. The number of revolutions rocked Europe during that period in 1848 especially, and that was the same year that was gold was discovered on the American River in California. Of course, we went through a bloody civil war World trade expanded uh, dramatically, and led by Great Britain and Queen Victoria, um, European imperialism spawned a race to colonize both Africa and Asia. The role of women, which is what we're here to talk about tonight, was limited during the Victorian era. To understand the lives of the wives and the daughters who took over California lighthouses during this time, we need to spend a few minutes understanding their role. So what better way to learn about Victoria, the Victorian era and how it affected women than by listening to a woman who actually experienced life in the second half of the 19th century. But we all know that the Maritime Museum is a magical place. So through the magic, of time travel and channeling, I want to introduce you now to Julia Williams, the keeper of the Santa Barbara Harbor Lighthouse for 40 years from, 19, from 1865 to 1905. Julia, are you there? 
Well, I must say, I am honored and humbled to be speaking before so many gentlemen and ladies. I am only a woman and don't go out much. I mostly stay at home. So it is a wonder to see how much the world has changed. Mr. Thompson assured me that you folks will countenance a mere woman speaking to you. Moreover, he told me that more than 80% of American women work outside the home. My land, that certainly is a big change. In my day, that's the second half of the 19th century, and I hope no one will be so untoward as to inquire about my age. <clears throat> In my day, only 15 to 20, 15 to 20 percent of us women folks worked outside the home. For most of us, our place was the home. We took care of our husbands and children, and the house and the garden. That's all. And for some of us, that was enough. As my grandmother used to say, bloom where you are planted. But some ladies wanted more than taking care of the home and family. What about you ladies? Please elevate your hand if you want more out of life than that. <laughs> oh my. Thank you. Well, just like you, some women in my time wanted more money, some wanted to get out of the house, and some wanted to achieve something. Well, I suppose there must be a lot of opportunities in your time, but it was very different when I was here. There were a few rare ladies who practiced law or medicine, but often only one woman attorney or one woman doctor in the whole town. Why, here in Santa Barbara, there was a female doctor, Dr. Harriet Belcher. She used to ride a horse when she made house calls, but women such as she were the exceptions. Now, back east, some young women worked in textile factories. The conditions were harsh and unhealthy, and the jobs were mindless, and the pay was low. But many, many young women preferred to work in a factory nonetheless. It was a chance for them to earn their own money, and they had the company of other women. It was preferable to working alone at home, caring for children, scrubbing the floors, doing the laundry by hand, ironing with a heavy sad iron, boiling pots of preserves on the stove in the heat of August. And in a factory, you had some relief from the tyranny of your father or husband. Does that sound appealing to any ladies here? <laughs> Most of the women who worked did women's work. That is, work that was suitable for a woman. Work that was an extension of what a woman's nature made her for. Sometimes it's hard to know exactly what women did to earn money because the census takers often ignored the little things that women did. Often husbands were embarrassed that their wives earned money. Women were also very quiet about their talent to earn money. As we used to say, it's best to hide your light under a bushel. Perhaps some women did not want the census takers to know about their side incomes. I don't suppose that happens anymore. 
<laughs> so what was women's work in the late 1800s? What else could women do to earn a little money? Often, it depended on what your father did or what your husband did. For example, if you lived on a farm, you could sell eggs or milk. You could bake some extra bread to make pies to sell or barter. If you were skilled enough to make butter or cheese, you could sell those as well. Flax was grown here in Santa Barbara, so some farm wives probably processed the flax and made it into thread or linen cloth. And there were a few women in Santa Barbara who had their own farms. If you lived in a town, you could work for a wealthy family as a servant. Here in Santa Barbara in 1860, for example, the most common job for a woman was working as a servant. Servants cleaned, cooked, washed and mended clothes, minded children, and in general, assisted the wealthy women with their womanly chores. Or instead of working in some other woman's house, you could do their laundry and ironing in your own home. If you could knit, you could make socks or scarves to sell. Teaching was one of the few professions where women were common. Teaching, especially grammar school, was considered an extension of child rearing. It was part of a woman's nature and was acceptable to society. Female teachers were, of course, paid less than male teachers. The female teachers generally boarded with the local family. The men teachers were married and had a family to support. When a woman married, of course, she had to leave her teaching job. That's just the way it was. Perhaps some of you have read the books by Laura Ingalls Wilder. She wrote a book called Little House on the Prairie. She was a teacher for several years until she married. Some women were newspaper writers. Generally, they were expected to write for the women's page. News about tea parties, days that ladies were at home, and little stories for children, and, and recipes. And speaking of writers, it was acceptable for women to earn some pin money as writers. Of course, one could only write after finishing the chores for the day, putting the children to bed. The women could write fiction or poetry, or maybe advice books for other women about household activities. A Santa Barbara woman named Mary J. Prentice, who lived on the Mesa, wrote articles for Food, Home, and Garden magazine. It was the magazine for the Vegetarian Society of America, headquartered in Philadelphia. Her recipe for vegetable stew appeared in the December 1898 issue. The most famous advice book for ladies of my day was written by Catherine Beecher, sister of Harriet Beecher Stowe. Catherine's book, a treatise on domestic economy for the use of young ladies at home and at school. Talked about the importance of women as teachers in the home and in schools for girls. Nursing was another profession that was approved of for women. As I'm sure you know, Clara Barton founded the Red Cross. I believe that organization still exists today. Is that right? <laughs> Clara began her career as a teacher. Then she turned her hand to nursing. 
She had to stop there because not many other professions were accepting of women. As I said before, it was acceptable for a woman to be a teacher or a nurse. Other professional careers were frowned on or downright prohibited. Society also countenanced midwives for the same reason that nurses were accepted. There was one midwife in Santa Barbara in 1860. Another occupation available to women was that of spinster. Now, Mr. Thompson told me that the word spinster is used differently today. Is that right? In my day, a spinster made thread on a spinning wheel. <laughs> Here in Santa Barbara, there were two women employed as spinsters in 1860. Now, can anyone tell me what spinsters in Santa Barbara would have used to make thread? Flax and wool, very good, smart group. And last but not least, there were two categories of women's pursuits at opposite ends of the spectrum. Can anyone guess what these were? <clears throat> Prostitutes and actresses, ladies of the night, members of the world's oldest profession. There were many words and phrases describing these women, but I don't want to offend the sensibilities of the fine ladies here tonight. <laughs> These women were walking the streets in my day. The other end of the range of occupation was nuns. Here in Santa Barbara in 1860, there were four nuns listed in the census. Now, I have left the best for last. A few lucky ladies who had male family members who worked as lighthouse keepers were able to earn money as lighthouse keepers themselves. The family connection helped, as did the fact that the lighthouse was literally an extension of the home. The lighthouse on the Mesa, for example, rose right out of the center of the house. And the work of caring for the light making sure that there was sufficient oil for the lamps, and cleaning the glass parts of the light in the morning. This was similar to work that women did every day. Well, thank you so much for listening to the chatterings of a mere woman. And now it's time for a man to continue this presentation. Thank you, Julia. I think you've really enlightened us about what life was, in fact, life like not that long ago. With that background, and I think it is an important background, we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the women that are honored up in that exhibit and who um, worked because their husbands and fathers left essentially the job to them. First, a little bit more background. Um, during the Mexican and Spanish periods of California, there were no lighthouses along the coast. So it was 1848 when the U.S. Congress, uh, I'm sorry, 1850, when the U.S. Congress, after the Mexican War, authorized seven lighthouses to be built on the California coast and one up in Oregon. Um, two of the first, um, were one that was built at Point Pinos at the southern entrance to Monterey Bay in 1853, and another up north at the entrance to Humboldt Bay. Well, a delay at Humboldt kept the light there from being operative until 1856, when a man by the name of Johnson, and sadly we don't know anything more about Mr. Johnson, became the, uh, was appointed keeper and became the head keeper. We know um, that he died in 1859 and that his wife, Sarah E. Johnson, was appointed to take his place. We know a little bit more about um, Charles Layton 
and his wife Charlotte at Point Pinos. Charles was an Englishman by birth, and Charlotte was born in Beaufort, North Carolina in 1824. Together, they sailed around, the Cape, around Cape Horn with their three children, arriving in California in 1847, well before the start of the gold rush. But when the gold rush started, they did go to the, to the mines, and in 1853, they came back from the mines and settled in Monterey. Isaac Wall, who was the U.S. Cust uh, collector of the port of Monterey, named um, Charles Layton as his assistant. Family moved into the lighthouse even while it was being built, but when it was lit in 1856, Charles was named the head keeper. <laughs> well, we know that California in the 1850s uh, was a time of conflict between Californios and Yankees. Isaac Wall was killed in 1855 by Anastasio Garcia, an outlaw. A posse was formed to hunt Anastasio down. It was successful, but in the process, Anastasio shot Charles Layton, and he died in November 1855 from that gunshot wound. Well, 10 days later, Charlotte was appointed keeper at the Point Pinos Lighthouse. And I do want to comment that's probably not Anastasio Garcia, but you get the idea. <laughs> OK, with both Sarah Johnson up at Humboldt Bay and um, Charlotte Layton at Point Pinos, I think we can conclude a couple of things about the lighthouse service and about women in the lighthouse service. First, the wife of a lighthouse keeper helped her husband tend the lights. And in so doing, she certainly learned the skills that were required of a lighthouse keeper. I have no doubt that lighthouse keeping was a shared responsibility, even though the husband got the title and the credit and the income. Second, I think we know that during the 1850s, it might have been difficult for the California or for the lighthouse service to hire men in California to be lighthouse keepers when there was so much more money to be made doing other things. And thirdly, a practice that seems really deeply embedded in the history of the lighthouse service and the naval officers who were a part of it um, was an understanding of the hardships a widow with a family faced with uh, the death of a lighthouse keeping husband faced. It was not just the loss of a mate or an income, difficult as those were, but it was also the loss of shelter. There were scant few opportunities um, for such women in Victorian America, as I think Julia has pointed out. Um, so a compassionate response from the Lighthouse Service, I think, benefited both the Lighthouse Service and the families of um, the lighthouse keeper who died. Charlotte Layton served as head keeper from 1855 to 1860. During that time, she had uh, male assistant keepers. One of them, second assistant George Harris, actually married Charlotte, and together they moved into Monterey in 1861, where they became hotel keepers. Charlotte um, died in Monterey in 1896, having lived out her life there. Well, Point Pinos had a second female keeper. Her name was Emily Maitland Fish, and her story is a very interesting one. Emily Maitland was born in Albion, Michigan in 1843, the second daughter of English immigrants. Her older sister, Juliet, married Dr. Melanchthon Fish and traveled the world with him settling for six years in China. And it was in China <clears throat> that Juliet gave birth to a daughter also named Juliet. And Juliet, the mother, either died in childbirth or shortly thereafter. Well, Emily, it would seem, hopped on a ship 
sailed out to China when the news reached her to care for the infant. Now, we don't know all the details here, but what we do know is that soon after, Emily married her late sister's husband, Melanchthon. They returned to the U.S. in time for the American Civil War, and Dr. Fish was a participant in General Sherman's march through Georgia with Emily by his side. She actually served in the U.S. Sanitation Service during the war. After the war, the couple settled into a very pleasant life in San Francisco. In 1888, Emily and Melanchthon hosted a society wedding for a stepdaughter, Juliet, to Navy Lieutenant Commander Henry E. Nichols. When Dr. Fish died in 1891, now Commander Nichols, Inspector of the Lighthouse District, California Lighthouse District for the U.S. Lighthouse Service, secured for his mother-in-law the headkeeper's job at Point Pinos in 1893. On the surface, I think it might seem strange that a society matron like Emily would take a job as a lighthouse keeper. But it made some sense during the waning years of the Victorian era. Um, after all, a lighthouse is a, li a house, and Emily made it into a very, very um, comfortable home. She had her furnishings moved from the Bay Area to Point Pinos, and her social connections in San Francisco transferred well to Monterey. Probably, although we don't know for sure, but probably there was a financial necessity for Emily to reduce her expenses. And here again, the Lighthouse Service stepped in to take care of their own. Well, when she was uh, finally ensconced at Point Pinos, she added expensive gardens around the Lighthouse, as well as bringing in um, purebred horses and French poodles and Holstein cattle. Emily made the best of her situation. She is known to have hosted um, teas for the naval officers who were stationed in Monterey, and she invited writers and artists to come to the lighthouse to have dinner with her. She joined with Mrs. Leland Stanford and Miss Lou Hicks, who was soon to be married to Herbert Hoover, in founding the Monterey Pacific Grove chapter of the American Red Cross. In 1898, she was chair of the Ladies' Welcoming Committee for the 50th anniversary of the landing of Commodore Sloat in Monterey, 50 years after American possession was declared. And she was a prominent guest in 1908 at the Grand Military Ball honoring Teddy Roosevelt when the Great White Fleet anchored in Monterey Bay in 1908. An interesting um, side note here is that Emily's stepdaughter, Juliet, Juliet Fish Nichols, was named headkeeper of the Point No Lighthouse on Angel Island in San Francisco Bay after her husband was killed in the Spanish-American War. Juliet and Emily both experienced firsthand the horrendous San Francisco earthquake of 1906. And we can, we can only imagine um, the horror with which Juliet um, helplessly watched the city crumble and burn across the bay without being able to do anything to help out. Well, Emily retired from the lighthouse service in 1914. She continued living in Pacific Grove and maintained her social activities there. She died finally in 1931 at the age of 88, and, uh, <clears throat> and she's buried alongside of Juliet Nichols and Melanchthon Fish in the Mountain View Cemetery in Oakland. Okay, uh, now I want to talk a little bit about higher educational opportunities because they were severely limited during the Victorian era, as I think um, Julia really pointed out. So it's in that context that I want to introduce you to um, the next keeper. Her name is Laura Heacock. She was the keeper at the Santa Cruz Light from 1883 to 1917. This lighthouse stood at the northern entrance to Monterey Bay, 
It was not one of the original eight lighthouses authorized by Congress. It was in the second batch of authorizations that was passed in 1852. It was intended as a harbor light to guide vessels into Santa Cruz, so it had a relatively small fifth order Fresnel lens showing a fixed white light in it. A land dispute stopped construction of the lighthouse, and it wasn't completed and lighted until 1870. Well, Aidan Hickok, uh, who was formerly a clergyman, was appointed first keeper. He moved into the lighthouse with his wife, Margaret, and his 14-year-old daughter, Laura, and 10-year-old son, Orville. The family had come overland from the east in 1846, and very soon thereafter had settled in Santa Cruz, where Edna um, bought property and became a local politician. Laura, on the left there, <clears throat> learned lighthouse keeping chores from her father, obviously. And when he died in 1883 at the age of 77, Laura, who was 29 years old at the time, was recommended by her brother-in-law, Captain Albert Brown, to take his place. The selection of Laura over her mother, Margaret, I think, was probably in recognition of Margaret's advancing years. Mother and daughter lived together in the lighthouse um, until Margaret's death. Living in a lighthouse, even as a child, was a great blessing for Laura. She was able to roam the beach and learn about the creatures um, that thrived there. She began collecting shells and soon increased her interest to other animals and fossils. As she grew, she became a, a serious conchologist, frequently corresponding with other shell collectors, professors, and experts in the field. Eventually, she was credited um, with the discovery of two new species, one of a banana slug and the other of a fossil remains of a spindle shell. And those two species were, in fact, named after her. This is something that would have been, I think, highly unlikely to have happened in ac academic cir uh, circumstances, because women at that time were not um, fondly looked at on university faculties. Laura converted uh, one of the spare rooms in the lighthouse into a small museum where she displayed her collections. They included biological uh, specimens, historical artifacts, and scrapbooks um, in which she had collected a wide range of, of clippings on subjects ranging from archaeology and astronomy to taxidermy and religion and all sorts of natural sciences in between. Tourists who came to uh, Santa Cruz to tour the lighthouse, of course, were invited to explore her collections. In 1902, when a new public library was opened in Santa Cruz, Laura was persuaded to donate her entire collection to be displayed there. The Heacock Museum opened in 1905, and today that collection is housed in the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History, still there. Laura retired from the lighthouse service in 1917 at age 63. She uh, moved to a cottage in Santa Cruz where she died there on August 18th, 1919. Okay, moving on. Now we've got the Point Furman Lighthouse and it is a handsome Itali Italianate design in a very true Victorian style. It was built on the Palos Verdes Peninsula in 1874 and named for Franciscan Padre Presidente uh, Furman Lasuen, and he it was named by for him by uh, English explorer George Vancouver. Two daughters, with assist from their sisters, tended uh, the light and kept it burning at Point Furman. The first, Mary Louise Smith, was the <coughs> first, excuse me was the first keeper at Point Furman. And she came from a lighthouse keeping family uh, through her father, George Knight Smith, who was the keeper of the Edis Hook Light in Washington Territory. Mary's brother, George's son, Victor, 
was a protege of President Lincoln's Secretary of the Treasury for which, uh, for which the Lighthouse Board is a department of the Department of the, uh, Treasury. So we think that's probably how the appointments came about to begin with. Well, things were not altogether smooth sailing at Edis Hook, so George um, decided to retire, and in 1870, he left Mary in charge. When Victor died, and I think this is important because things were not going well for the family, when Victor died, Mary was moved to Point Furman in 1874 at a salary of $800 a year. Roughly, that would translate into a salary of $16,250 in today's money. So clearly not a high paying job, but on the other hand, it, it included uh, shelter as well as the income. Um, Mary brought her young sister along um, at a salary of $600 a year, so I'm sure that, that helped out some. Smith family turmoil continued at Point Furman. Um, there's a lot of story here, but um, when Ella left to return to Washington State, Mary ran afoul of the new assistant keeper. His name was James Harold. He was a Civil War veteran who came to Point Furman with a wife and two daughters. Uh, the relationship soon uh, deteriorated to a kind of a she said, he said, war of correspondence back with the Lighthouse Board. Um, the board tried to sort things out and finally they could not. So the Lighthouse District Inspector wrote to them, I respectfully recommend that Ms. Smith be removed from the position of keeper as I feel confident it will be impossible to obtain a male assistant to remain under her. But then he went on to recommend the removal of Mr. Harold also. Well, the other sister act at Point Foreman was Thelma and Juanita Austin. The Austin name may be familiar to some of you who have read my Point Conception book because William Willie Austin was an assistant keeper at Point Conception. His granddaughter, Martha McKenzie, is with us tonight as is um, Henrietta E. Mosley, who was the author of the book Point Furman, Lighthouse Families, 1874 to 1927, from which obviously I have taken a great deal of research. Um, Willie fought for several years for a transfer in order to be able to educate his family, his children. It was impossible to get a good education for them at Point Conception. And finally, um, in 1917, he did receive the appointment to Point Furman. And by all accounts, the Austin family was a large, well-bonded, and generally happy family in their very spacious lighthouse. And it was a blow, therefore, when Willie died within months of his beloved wife Martha's passing in 1925. In an effort to hold the family together and to keep them in one place, Thelma Austin, who was just 24 years old at the time, applied for and received the appointment of keeper. Unofficially, Juanita was her assistant. And again, I think this is another example of the Bureau of Lighthouses, which um, had replaced the Lighthouse Board in maintaining the tradition of taking care of their own. As the Austin family uh, and the children came of age and moved on, so in fact did the lighthouse. It was electrified in 1925, minimizing the keeper's duties dramatically, and was finally turned over to the city of Los Angeles. Juanita married in 1926, leaving Thelma alone. Thelma was able to take a job part-time, and she married soon thereafter. So now, I want to devote the time that's remaining tonight to talk about arguably the most famous female lighthouse keeper on the California coast. Earlier you met Julia Williams, our very own keeper of the Santa Barbara Harbor Light, 
often referred to as the Mesa Lighthouse. Many, perhaps uh, a lot, well, perhaps many of you are not aware um, that we had a lighthouse on the Mesa until 1925 when the earthquake brought it down. But for 40 years, 40 years from 1865 to 1905, Julia Williams tended the light and raised her family. Julia was born and raised on the island of Campobello in the Bay of Fundy, New Brunswick, Canada in 1825. She married Albert Johnson Williams from Waterville, Maine in the late 1840s. In 1849, Albert left her pregnant with their first child in Eastport, Maine in order to join the rush for gold in California. Stopping in Panama for six months, he ran a hotel and accumulated a grub stake uh, at $4,000. Arriving in San Francisco, Albert immediately went to the diggings uh, where he found an uh, easier way to make a living than panning for gold. He did it by running a ferry across the Mokalami River uh, for a toll and then finally building a toll bridge across the river. In 1853, Julia and their three-year-old daughter, Helen Francis, followed Albert to San Francisco. For a time, they lived in a house on Second Street, surrounded by friends and Albert's brother. It is not clear how Albert supported the family at this time, but perhaps he had sufficient income from his bridge business to uh, keep them uh, living comfortably. But by 1856, that was not the case. He needed employment. Uh, perhaps we can discern a pattern of restlessness here that may explain Albert's activities when he came to Santa Barbara. He found employment in the appointment uh, to be keeper of the yet to be built Santa Barbara Harbor Lighthouse. His appointment was approved by President Franklin Pierce. The lighthouse, one of the second eight, to be designated on the Pacific Coast was built on the Mesa west of the city on 30 acres of land donated by the city fathers. We could talk a little bit about exactly where that might have been. There's some controversy, but I think we've got it pretty well pegged down to being on the current school property that's there um, up slope from the actual bluffs. Albert and Julia, now pregnant with her third child, came to Santa Barbara on the steamship Seabird in the spring of 1856. Perhaps unaware that the lighthouse was not yet ready for occupancy, Albert secured a home for his family in an adobe on the north corner of State and Montecito Streets. In his journal, local attorney Charles Enoch Hughes recorded, quote, Sunday, July 15th, we went to the house of Senor Williams. He presented his wife, an intelligent woman of good appearance, unquote. Then they all went to the lighthouse where the builder, G.D. Nagel, told them he was rushing to finish building it. And Hughes commented he must have been rushing because he had his crew working on a Sunday. The Williams family moved into the lighthouse um, before it was completed. The lamp with its fourth order Fresnel lens showing a fixed red light was first lighted on December 11th, 1856. And a year later, at Christmas time, Julia invited all the American residents of Santa Barbara to come to a Christmas dinner. And it's reported that 30 people attended. Albert tended the light and Julia tended her growing family, now numbering four children, until 1860. Then things started to change. First of all, the weather changed. The winter of 1861-62 saw heavy rains and flooding in Santa Barbara and in other parts of California. Bayon Williams, Julia's, Julia's oldest son, noted that it was too dangerous to cross Mission Creek on horseback. So a ferry had to be rigged on a cable to get people across. Then in 1863, uh, California was struck with a vengeance uh, of drought 
that continued uh, unabated into 1864. Before that time, cattle had grazed freely on the mesa around the lighthouse. Julia's daughter, Helen, recalled, quote, I remember once it was impossible for me to get to town for four days because there were so many cattle between us and the city, we dared not risk going. By 1864, cattle which had numbered 250,000 head in Santa Barbara County was reduced to just 5,000 head of cattle because of the drought. The other 245,000 either um, starved or were slaughtered. Well, the first half of the 1860s um, was also a time of change for Albert Williams. One source says, quote, Mr. Williams tired of the confinement of the lighthouse and sought another vocation. And Albert does seem to have been a restless man. His son, Bion, sheds very little light on what transpired, but on two occasions he does write, father stayed in town most of the time. Then later, Bion explains, after keeping the light for four years, another keeper, through a misunderstanding, was sent to the station, and Mr. Williams at once packed up and left. Well, the other keeper, or perhaps it was several keepers, I think that's not quite sure, um, and it's not quite sure what exactly transpired from 1860 when Albert left to 1865, um, and maybe Julia can shed some light on that when we talk to her. <laughs> but we do know from the record that Julia Williams became the official keeper of the Santa Barbara Harbor Light on February 13th, 1865. Julia was, Julia's was a reign much like Queen Victoria's reign. It lasted 40 years until 1905 when a fall crippled her and made it impossible to climb the steps to the light. Over that time, she was hardly away from the light at night. One record says Julia left her daughter Helen in charge for one night in the early days. And in 1900, an interviewer wrote, quote, but one night in all those years, she has been absent from the lighthouse, a night she spent with friends in Carpinteria. And but for a few nights beside when the light was in the care of others. So that's a little, little indefinite as to how many nights, but the bottom line is she virtually missed no night in those 40 years tending that light. Julia was so committed to keeping the mariners around the lighthouse safe that she kept three sets of lamps just in case one didn't work. Not only did she tend the light, she raised four children there and she also drove to town regularly to attend church and visit socially with her friends. In 1872, with the building of Stern's Wharf, Santa Barbara attracted a growing number of tourists. It's clear that the mission was the main attraction then, just as it is now, but the press seems to indicate that the Mesa Lighthouse and the woman keeper there was a close second. Julia became a celebrity of sorts. In 1896, the San Francisco Call, one of several newspapers to chronicle her life, um, the writer wrote, on the wayside, as you journey towards the beacon tower, the scarlet geraniums tossed by the brisk breeze and the fragrant white roses shedding their sweetest perfume from the trellised arch over the pathway and behind the building, pretty waving green trees, dense with foliage, greet you. That's a heck of a sentence. <laughs> she goes on to say to the accompaniment of uh, faint roaring of the breakers that is borne up by the telltale breeze, Julia F. Williams tells how 32 in 32 years, she has never missed a single day. She has been constant to her trust. Well, interestingly, Helen, Julia's daughter, tells of a time in the 1870s when a group of fashionably dressed, Helen's words, fashionably dressed, 
young men and women came to tour the lighthouse. She says, in the party of sightseers, there was a beautifully dressed young lady with an unusually full skirt and hoops to match. It took a little bit of maneuvering for her to get through the trap door to the lantern room <laughs> as she went up. At that time, the room was just big enough for a person to walk comfortably around the light. There was no more danger of soiling her fine garment from the lamp as than there is now, for the same rules existed and every part of the lamp and its brass works was spotless. Helen goes on. The tourist troubles really began when she started to descend from the lamp room. <laughs> Try as she would, it was impossible to get herself and her hoops through the small trap door. At last mother, that would be Julia, suggested the men in the party go below. <laughs> then the lady removed the hoops, threw them out the window into the yard, <laughs> and had no trouble getting down the ladder. As I mentioned earlier, when Julian Albert uh, arrived in Santa Barbara in 1856, um, it was a sleepy town of adobe brick homes with a population something under 2,500. At her death, we had become a Victorian city of something over 11,000 people. So here are just a few of the major changes that took place in Santa Barbara that Julia witnessed while she was Keeper of the Light. Of course, Stern's Wharf in 1872, and again in 1872, the Courthouse and Hall of Records. In 1887, the arrival of the first uh, train from Los Angeles. The following year, 1888, the building of Cottage Hospital. And in 1903, the opening of the beautiful Potter Hotel. Now, I believe Julia Williams was a modest, unassuming woman. She tended the light, raised her family, and played an active role in the changing Santa Barbara community without a lot of fanfare. She lived in a lighthouse, but it, to, her, to her it was a home. So I think it was a very sad day for her in May 1905 when she had a fall. It was probably just a fall out of bed, not an uncommon thing for an 81-year-old. And perhaps Julia realized at that time that her way of life for more than the last 40 years was coming to an end. But she tenaciously fought against that. She kept tending the light through the pain, climbing the steps to light the lamp each night, climbing the steps again at midnight to make sure that everything was working properly, and climbing them again in the morning to douse the lamp and pull the shade around the lantern room. Until that is, local doctor Robert Winchester told her she had a broken hip. He placed her in a plastic cast and confined her to Cottage Hospital. The inspector of lights for the California district tried to cover for her for a while, but it couldn't go on. It couldn't go on indefinitely, and so she was retired from the lighthouse service. She lived on as a cripple for a bit more than five years, dying on July 1st, 1911. Tonight, we've heard a lot about Julia Williams, but none of it from her own mouth. As the modest woman I believe her to have been, she never said much about her own life. So now, I wanna recall Julia Williams back to the podium um, from the past in order to end the lecture by telling you in her, home, in her own words what it was like to be a lighthouse keeper. Julia. The best years of my life have been right here. 
I came here in 56, when I was not quite 31. In all that time, I have stayed away from the house just one night. Every night in all those years, I took care of the lights, and with the exception of three weeks when my last boy was born, I have three other boys and a daughter you know. When they were babies, they couldn't help me. And when they were older, I couldn't trust them. <laughs> they always forgot. So anyway, I put it, I had to climb the stairs just the same. I always felt more comfortable when I had set them all going myself. I never had time to grow old. I've been too busy. I never found it monotonous or tiresome. We have the sea for company always, and I have been happy and always content here. There were not many people to come out this way when we first came here. The Spanish women used to come out this way, sometimes with the women in ox carts and the men riding beside them. I go up the stairs in the early evening and light the lamps. I love to watch the beams flash out over the waters. It is wonderful how bright it will be on a stormy night when the clouds almost seem to be resting on the crests of the tossing waves. Then again at midnight, always, I come up again to see that all is well. It is then that I love best to stand and watch the sea when it is calm and peaceful under the light of the moon or just the stars the silence and the majesty of it is inspiring. And when the storm is raging and a lonely ship is struggling along, aided by my light, I fancy that it is like a soul in the sea of life, buffeted but guided by the light of the sea of Bethlehem. Thank you. This is Betsy J. Green. She is a wonderful historian and writer in her own right. She writes a column for the Mesa newspaper. She also writes a column for um, edhat.com. She tells me she is at work on a couple of books about Santa Barbara history. I suspect one of them is uh, about Victorian architecture because I know she loves that. And she whispered to me as I was asking her about her bio, she said, in my misspent youth, I was an editor at Reader's Digest and World Book Encyclopedia. So again, let's hear it for Betsy. Thank you again, Willard. Th thank you, Julia, I mean, Betsy. <laughs> thank you very much.